Yes, could you explain, uh, I think I understand it, but in terms of what's referred to as the soul with the, as the not the soul, the self with a capital S, how yeah. what you are just talking about. Talking about, that. yes, I, I mean, there is a whole ambiguity and also differentiation between spirit and soul or self. Um, I use the word self as what is in India called the Atma, the higher self. Now, as far as I understand it, we each have within a, have a divine substance, a divine essence, the part of ourself that is never separate from God. And as far as I understand, and it, I've actually seen it happen, that divine essence, that divine light, that pure consciousness incarnates into the womb of the woman where it then takes on a physical form which it actually comes in at three months when the woman is pregnant for three months and then that is incarnated as a baby that then becomes a person. And part of the spiritual journey is to consciously reconnect with that divine essence, divine consciousness. There is this saying in the Upanishads that two birds sat on the branch of the tree, one ate the fruit of the tree, the other looked on. And the part that is eating the fruit of the tree is the ego, the I, that has all the experiences in life. And for most people, the Atma, the self, looks on. It just, it is present, but it does not directly participate in life. And then, for most people, they do not have complete access to that until they die. When you go through the tunnel, at the end of the tunnel, there is this light, which people say is God, but it's not God. It is their self, their Atma, their higher consciousness, which you then reconnect with and you take to it the essential experiences that you've had in this world. If you do spiritual practice, you try to connect with that higher consciousness, with the self, while you are present in this world, in this body. And on the Sufi path, this is the process of fanar where you where the ego that grips you in this world becomes annihilated or you become less and less attached to it until you have these experiences of merging into your higher self, into the Atma. And there comes these, it's called in, in Sanskrit, Samadhi, where you have full consciousness on the plane of the self, of this body, body consciousness. In, Sufism, it is really the state of Bakar, abiding in God. And, um, and that is a plane of consciousness or a state of consciousness of complete love, because on the plane of the self is a plane of pure love. It is a plane of pure oneness. On the plane of the self, everything is one. It is also on that plane you realize your true nature, who you really are. Um, and all those qualities, it has a a quality of bliss. Bliss is actually the sheath of the soul or the self. I use the word synonymously. It is a, when you have experiences of bliss, that is, they call it anandamaya kosha, you, you touch the sheath of the soul. The essence of the self is a state of peace, and you can have that. It's called the, the peace that parteth understanding. It is not dependent on any outer event or happening. It is a state of pure peace. So that really is our spiritual birthright, and all spiritual practices are a way of connecting with that and eventually getting this shift of consciousness from the ego into the self. Um, it's actually very interesting to see how it happens the other way around, how the soul comes into this world 
and from the light of the self, it develops an ego consciousness so that it can function in this world. So it comes from union into this world of separation, and then if you follow a spiritual path, you aspire to go back from that illusory state of separation back into the oneness of the self. And, um, and supposedly, if you have direct realization on the plane of the self, you don't have to reincarnate the next time. That's what they say, but who knows? Yeah? Can you talk about how that, that place of longing and the connection to love, mm -hmm. how we can use that now on the planet as part of, um, part of what we're needed here for? Yeah, very important question. How can one use this quality of longing not just for one's own individual journey, but for the sake of the whole, for the sake of planetary evolution or to help the crisis. First of all, one should say that the spiritual journey does not belong to you. This is one of the great misunderstandings when spirituality came to the West, that because we, it got caught up in the self-development movement and people thought, I'm going to follow a spiritual path so I can develop better and I can have these higher states of consciousness, which is, of course, a complete misunderstanding because, well, they say, it says in the Quran, Allah guides to Allah whom Allah will. It is not about us. It never was about us. It is always about the whole. So, essentially, anybody who does the inner work, who follows a spiritual path, whatever its nature, as long as it's a, a true spiritual path that is not a spiritualized ego in interpretation of a spiritual path, and there's a big difference, is doing the work for the whole, because it belongs to the whole, because it belongs to God. Now, having said that, I do believe that there is... Um, and if one is completely surrendered to that, then one is just used by God, by the divine, for the divine purpose. Having said that, I do feel it is important or valuable to hold in one's consciousness a place for divine revelation, a place for divine presence in this world. I am completely convinced as a mystic that the only way Maybe I should just pre-ramble by that and says, on the individual journey, most of us at some point reach a place where we cannot go on anymore. We reach a state of crisis, a state of complete despair. And there is actually a whole literature that describes the need to reach that place of complete despair. And when you reach that place of complete despair, something in you cries out to God, help me. I can't anymore. I cannot manage anymore. And something in you also bows down before God at that moment. You, you cannot continue anymore. It is beyond you. And at that moment, then, in a way, the gates of grace open. And there is something comes into your life directly from the source, directly from God. That transforms you. And only that substance, only that divine gift can actually transform you. It, it is something that sadly has not been fully understood in the West, which I think has to do with this Puritan culture, with its focus on self-help, on, on effort, that only grace can really transform you. All of your efforts, Rumi says, all of your efforts can, cannot even take you to the first way station. So it is this moment of divine grace that comes into your life and changes you. And many of us have had that experience. And you actually go through it on different levels on the spiral of the journey. You get taken to a place where you just cannot go on anymore. And it's a moment of complete despair, or it can be a feeling of complete abandonment or whatever. Now, 
as far as I can understand, we have just about reached that, or in fact, we have reached that place on a planetary stage to do with the planetary evolution. And the macrocosm and microcosm understanding shows that what happens for the individual in their evolution also happens for the whole. And in a way, when you read the sort of literature that shows any awareness of the present situation, you read between the lines and you see that even basic things like global warming is accelerating faster than people understand. There is water scarcity. We don't know what to do. We don't have the resources. And we have this kind of infantile fantasy that we're going to discover new technology that's suddenly going to you know, enable us to continue this materialistic dream for another 100 years or 200 years. And because we have banished the sacred from the, being the center of our existence, as it has been in every other civilization since the very, very beginning, as far as I can see, we're the only civilization that does not place the sacred at the middle. We're left in this um, predicament that we can't go on anymore. We can't solve the situation. And yet, collectively, we don't understand what to do at that time. Uh, you know, there is a, there is a slight uh, echo of it in the Bible in the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah when, you know, God said he was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah and there was a holy man who said, look, please don't destroy it. You know, if I find ten people who remember you, will you destroy it? And God said, no, of course not. So the holy man went off and he came back and said, God, what about five? You know? And God said, sure, won't destroy the cities if I find five. You know, he came back, what about two? You know, what about one? And then, of course, Sodom and Gomorrah got destroyed. Um, so we have this hubris or this self-created image that we can solve it and yet we can't solve it. And which is exactly what happens within the individual. The, the difference, if you like, is that the individual who's been taken to that place has enough common sense to cry out to God. And yet, we banish God, we've forgotten about God, and so collectively, we can't cry out to God. If, if you read the, you know, I mean, like Copenhagen was a farce. I mean, it was a terrible farce because it showed that all the countries of the world coming together to deal with the most pressing crisis this planet has experienced for how long couldn't get their act together because economic short-term self-interest was much more important than the, the fate of the planet, right? So when you get to that place, something has to cry out to God. Now, I am hoping maybe too optimistically, that those of us who carry this remembrance, who carry this longing, who carry this divine light in our hearts, can be a place in the world that cries out to God. Just as the soul of the world itself can cry out to God. Because otherwise, I don't know what's going to happen. Because everything... You know, you don't have to be a prophet. You don't have to be a visionary to, to sing, we're just making more and more of a mess of it, and we can't even come to a general consensus to do anything about it, right? So that's fine if at that place something in you cries out to God. But if nobody remembers that that's what you do at this time, because we live in such a state of collective forgetfulness, and everybody has forgotten that there is such a thing about grace. And even more, everybody has forgotten the world actually belongs to God. Because when you get to that place inside of yourself, something in you remembers that you belong to God. Something in you lives that cry, that which is a connection. This is this line from Rumi when he says, love's most strange, most holy mystery. We are intimate beyond belief. 
when you get to that place in yourself and something cries out, you know that you are part of God. And in that knowing you are part of God, you realize that only grace can heal you. Only grace can take you out of your present predicament. But if you don't believe you are part of God, because the whole culture for centuries has said, God's in heaven and we're just, we live in this rational world, there is a really, really big problem. Um, and it's a much, much bigger problem than people are aware of. And it's actually a much, much bigger problem in America than people are aware of. And this is where it gets, um, because America actually has a global responsibility because it is, it has been given a lot. This country has been given a lot. This country has been given in a way, you can say just materialistically, but it's also been given a certain freedom. There aren't so many countries in the world where you can actually say what you want without being put in prison. It's, it's when you look around the world, there aren't so many places. It has been given a lot. And somehow it is reluctant to take real responsibility for what it has been given globally. So given what you said, can we use those moments where we're crying out? Can we be used? Can we be used? used? Okay. Yes, because in, that is the only hope. You in know, in Sodom and Gomorrah, there wasn't one person, so the city went. <laughs> I don't know the optimum number. I don't know what is needed. <laughs> I'm not you know? asking that. Um, I'm not it is, asking. It, it is, and the, the crux of that moment is whether you cry out to God, not for yourself, but for but whether everyone. You, whether for something everything. in you cries out to God for his sake, for the sake of the whole of creation. And in that moment, the divine and the human can come together. And then miracles can happen. That's what I'm looking for. <laughs> That's the only hope. Yeah. Thank That's you. what I came here to hear. Yeah. Just exactly Good. that. Good. Thank you. So then there is hope. Then there is hope. But I would just add one thing, that there are a lot of forces present in our culture that do not want that to happen. Would you talk about... Um, the awe of God. The awe of God, sure. And mm -hmm. the fear of God. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, the Sufis actually have a whole... psychology of awe and fear, which begins with fear. The Sufis talk about the opposites of fear and hope at the beginning. You are in fear of God, and you hope for God. It is those opposites. And you're never allowed to remain completely in fear or completely in hope. Hope is expansive. Hope, I hope to be with God. Fear is contracted. I am frightened of God. And of course, that, also, that fear also gets played out in relationship with the teacher. You know, for many, many years, each time I knocked on my teacher's door, there was this fear. Because it is the other. You don't know what it is. You, you can't control it. You can't contain it. You can't, it doesn't belong to your limited consciousness. So there is this visceral fear. You are frightened. And it is quite right. You should be frightened. As, as a mystic, sometimes you are terrified. And so you live with that. It's like it's important. It is recognizing that it is the other. It is recognizing it is not something under your control, not something that you can hold. And then as the states change, you go from fear and hope to intimacy and awe. And for the Sufi, these two states of intimacy and awe are very, very important because one, one of the gifts of the path that is, I think, completely unbelievable is you are given these states of intimacy with God. And Sufis call them states of nearness. 
this incredible states of tenderness, of closeness, of being held in love, of being saturated by love. And you really don't believe it's possible to be loved so much, to be, have so much intimacy. And it can be for a moment, it can be for hours, it can sometimes be for days. You are held in these states of, of intimacy, of nearness, and that's why the, the Sufis say, he is nearer to you than your jugular vein. He is really, he is so close to you. It is, I think, one of the great, great gifts of Sufism to have those experiences of love. But, there is the other side, and that you learn that you learn to bow down before God. You learn about awe. You learn awe in its deepest sense that that it is God. And we personalize so much in our culture. It, it is. I don't know if it will always be like this, because it's very strange when you look at it from the outside, the degree to which we've personalized it. And, you know, yes, it is wonderful to have personal relationship to God, but one should never, ever forget the side of awe, the side of might and majesty, of power. It is a tremendous force, power, intelligence, call it what you will, that you are having a relationship with. This is not somebody you can control, you can manipulate, you can... Um, you know, Shamsi Tabriz says, it's not like somebody you just sit down and have a bowl of soup with. <laughs> you know, this is the boss, the big boss. And Ibn al-Arabi says very, very clearly, you remember the servant is always the servant. The Lord is always the Lord. He is our Lord. And you bow down before him. And, and it is one thing you learn to do if you really are on a mystical path is how to bow down before God. Mostly, of course, this is an inner state within the heart. But there is also a practice sometimes one does in the middle of the night when nobody is looking. And you just get down on your knees and you bow down before God because it is God, because it is so tremendous, because it is awe-inspiring. And I think it's very sad that we have lost that element in our culture. We have lost, in a way, we respect so little, and I don't know how much we respect God. And I have a little wonder, you know, like I was saying to this lady over here that I personally feel that, the, that it is time for God to come back. I think he has been absent for his world for too long. I mean, this is just me. Who am I to think this? But okay, I share these feelings because they are my feelings. And I think the situation is so dire that it can only be redeemed by the presence of God. I don't see, because too much light has gone out of the world. We have misused it too much. We have taken this beautiful, beautiful planet for which we were asked to be vice-regent. When we were taught the names, when Adam was taught the names of creation, and he was asked to be vice-regent of the world, which means to look after the world and to have respect for the world. And we have we have raped it, we have pillaged it, we have done terrible things to this world, unbelievable things. And what's more, we have done it to the outer world, to the physical world, so now we are faced with this ecological crisis. We have also done it to the inner world, to those places of beauty in the inner world, in the symbolic world, where there used to be such beautiful temples, such magical groves you could go to in meditation, you could go to in prayer, that would refresh your soul, that would nourish you. And we have raped it all, this you know, recent travesty of something called the secret that became sold in America, which is a way to use the inner world to get what you want. I mean, I would have thought that, you know, we have prostituted enough in this culture to prostitute the soul of the world for a few paltry 
desires. Okay, so we have done it. It is so horrible what we have done. You know, strip mind the world, strip mind the soul of the world. For what? So we can drive motor cars and have refrigerators. Okay. And the we have forgotten what the world is. And I don't know if there is enough light of remembrance to carry the world forward. And I feel that the only way, maybe just because I'm a mystic, because that's how I have experienced things, the only way for the world to be healed and transformed is by the presence of God, by the living presence of God, not as some abstract idea, but as a dynamic presence. Now, because I'm a mystic, I know what that means. I was in my early 20s when I first felt the incredible power of my sheikh in the inner world. Incredible power. I know what that power means. I know you don't argue with it. You don't negotiate. You bow down as quickly as you can. And, and things happen. And this is the stuff of miracles. This is the stuff of of people talk about shift in consciousness. We can't shift our own consciousness. We can't even clean up our own backyard. But the divine could shift our consciousness if the divine exercised the power that belongs to the divine. But I have a deep concern is that we don't know how to bow down before God anymore. If that power comes back, if that authority comes back, if that we don't know what to do with it. We've forgotten how to get on our knees. And, you know, we think the world belongs to us. This is an incredible act of hubris. Unbelievable act. It never belonged to us. At least in this country, until a few centuries ago, there was a Native American culture that understood to whom the land belonged. But that they were got rid of. And, you know, one, one learns how to tremble before God. One learns the real meaning of awe. And you don't know what's going to happen. As a mystic, you never know what's going to happen from day to day. Everything you hold precious can be gone in a moment. And you bow down before that with a capital T. And you learn how to do it. And you learn that if you, you know, this is the, the story of the, of the gnat and the west wind. You know, the gnat complained to Solomon that the west wind was always bothering him. And so Solomon, being Solomon and very wise, said, well, you know, I have to hear the other side of the argument. And so he called the west wind. And of course, when the west wind came, the gnat was blown away. <laughs> No, we, we've forgotten what it means to be in the presence of that energy, of that power. And so although, you know, I long for that divine energy to make his presence felt again, for God to reclaim his world, to put it simply, I'm a little hesitant about how people will respond because we have forgotten. We like the idea, we read our Rumi, we like the intimacy with God. We like the nearness, we like this love affair. But there is another side to the love affair with God. You know, and you just, it's not, it's not on your terms. And it's not the day you necessarily put aside for it. So, you learn to bow down before his beauty and his terror. And always remember, though, this, the prayer, which is God's prayer. And I, may thy mercy be greater than thy justice. And that is also what we pray for. May his mercy be greater than his justice. But it is very, very important, the awe, to, the awe one has before God, because it is God. This is not some self-development process. This is encounter 
with a tremendous, tremendous power that has been forgotten in this world for a very long time. <laughs>